Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy. I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you? I am filled with a seething rage. How are you, Cass? I'm, uh, I'm just exhausted. I think I'm, I'm honestly, I'm just, I'm just so tired. Um, we're doing another update on this. We're doing, this is now, I, we did one um, several days ago with Mike Hersberg. Um, and we did one before that, the day before. Um, I think people are kind of hoping that there will be some sort of, uh, that, that, that we already have all the updates, that everything has happened, the collapse is over, like, here we are, we're at the bottom. But that isn't the update. The update is that things haven't really changed all that much, as far as I can tell. Um, we kind of have a lot of noise. Um, can we, can we talk about... I guess I know there's I know there's fears of contagion. We haven't seen anything confirmed at all yet, but uh, let's talk about some of the entities that are involved in what's going on. Well, which one of the entities do you want to start with? Feel free to pick pick your pick your poison here. Let's start with BlockFi, since it was just reported this afternoon that they're likely going to file for bankruptcy, which makes sense because they were on the verge of bankruptcy until they got that line of credit from FTX US. So the fact that they are now bankrupt is not particularly surprising. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, we did uh, a previous episode about all of the cryptocurrency lending platforms. Um, at that time, uh, we the main ones that we were focused on were BlockFi, Celsius, and Nexo. And so now with BlockFi officially looking to file bankruptcy, that means we're swinging two out of three so far. Um, the Celsius is long gone. I don't think anyone even really thinks about it these days. Um, but outside of that, yeah, now we Kelvin have- Kelvin project, it's coming back. The Kelvin, right? We're going straight to zero. Um, yeah, so we have that, we have, uh, and then we have Nexo, which I haven't heard a lot of rumors about Nexo. Have you? Well, no, uh, there were the, I, I mentioned in some, of my, in some of the reporting at Protoss that there were the withdrawals to Nexo totaling like 116 million or something in like the days right before FTX closed off withdrawals. Nexo was one of the largest withdrawers by far. Um, or someone was posting a bunch of collateral over at Nexo if someone might have had a loan there that was getting close to a liquidation price, hypothetically. Um, and so those flows went to Nexo. I've not heard any real concerns over Nexo solvency beyond like the general crypto lenders seem to have a business model that involves them lending out to counterparties who are not responsible. And so all lenders have serious risks that you should seriously consider before using them like and salt lending today closed withdrawals because they were they uh were exposed to alameda and ftx and so, <coughs> excuse me and so like these lending platforms have this built-in risk just by the way they conduct their business model yeah this is part of my point um is essentially that we we in the, the episode long ago the question that we had about the lenders as well was where is this magical high yield coming from um and it is impossible to answer that because now we're seeing that there was no magical high yield it was all it it, it wasn't magic at all it was imagined um it, it it's gone it's all gone now um so that's that's update well, one no, Go on. also also on the note of lenders we should talk about what's probably the largest loan book in all of crypto genesis trading Genesis Trading, who initially came out and said they only had a $7 million loss, who then got an emergency equity infusion, sorry, not an emergency equity infusion, a totally routine equity infusion for a totally healthy balance sheet for like $140 million or something from DCG. And then they announced that, oh, also we had $140 million in assets on FTX. We probably aren't going to get back. And they want us to believe 
that is the total extent of their losses. I think it's important here for me to mention that like their OTC desk was one of the most active uh, FTX token OTC desk, and like at one point had over three million sitting in their wallets that I could easily see, and like a whole bunch of it flowed from Three Arrows Capital and from Alameda Research through Genesis for these trades of FTX token, and that they are claiming that they had no exposure at the time and it looks like all the ftx token was transferred out of their wallets like in the days immediately preceding like things getting closed but i think it is very plausible that there is additional exposure that we have not heard of yet yeah and genesis so i like the did you mention that 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 money that they received i believe that was from um dcg is that right Yes, yeah, the equity infusion was from DCG, their parent company. Right, so their parent company is um, Digital Currency Group, which, again, if anyone is unfamiliar, they, uh, man, they just have their, they have their hands in everything. We got to have um, Nick from Coindesk on, and I specifically discussed with him, like, how much exposure to the, to the system D DCG maintains, and it is a lot. Um, on the note of DCG's many products and exposures, GBTC, which is the Bitcoin vehicle that has caused problems for Three Arrows Capital and now Alameda Research, is trading at like a 45% discount to net asset value, I think, right now, and may descend further when whatever Alameda Research is still holding ends up liquidated. And they are still also currently suing the SEC to convince the SEC to convert them into an EFT. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, another episode that we have, we talked to James Safart um, uh, from Bloomberg, and we specifically talked about the ETF and the likelihood of it being realized. And uh, I think even then, I, I'm pretty sure James told us, like, it's just not likely it's going to happen this year or really anytime soon. Um, revisit that episode if you want, because, yeah, spot on. Not going to happen. Not right now. So, sorry, Adri, this is a bit of a tangent and a thing I just realized. Um, there was some reporting that came out that suggested that Gary Gensler and Sam Bankman-Fried may have been having a conversation about onshoring FTX, bringing FTX back to the United States. And what's interesting about this is that we talked about with James Safer that the Bitcoin ETF was being used as like a point of leverage, we thought, to potentially allow the SEC to get these surveillance agreements with the exchanges so that they could see better into them. And so if FTX was going to be like one of the first ones to sign this surveillance agreement as part of like this, them coming back on shore to the U.S. and presumably some of their previous behaviors no longer being looked into that that would have then further pressured other exchanges to then agree to it and so i wonder like what the current stance is in the sec and like whether they're still going to continue to use the etfs and stuff to try to get that kind of surveillance because i think there's going to be more popular support for that now that there's another highly visible crash um, so I think it's worth discussing this because this is an entirely different point, really. I know we're somehow finagling a way to discuss it with an ETF, fine. But um, Gary is in trouble. Gary Gensler is in deep, deep doo-doo. There is no doubt about it. I Like, no coiners, coiners, critics, shillers, everyone is on the same page with this one. This dude is going to have to sit in front of Congress and explain himself and it isn't going to be easy. And this, this to me, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll be proven very wrong. But to me, this is the end of his career. Like, the, the, there is no comeback here, as far as I'm concerned. He's lost the confidence of the industry, of this industry, but of the financial industry, it feels like. Because um, he, he didn't protect anybody. But then people will say, well, FTX wasn't on American soil. But as you just said, Boy, he sure was trying to get that to happen. And that's that's unfortunate. Maybe, maybe. I guess assuming it's not confirmed. Assuming the reporting is accurate, there is some SEC negotiations to onshore a massive criminal fraud certainly do not look good. Sorry, we don't know it's a criminal fraud yet, but I'm going to say it's a criminal fraud. Um, oh, I'm so tired of it. I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> Anyone, anyone suggesting that there wasn't a crime committed here, 
seek help. <laughs> like this, 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 this is theft. This is theft. This is fraud. This is, it, you want anyone to be specific about what kind of frauds? I, I think it, it sure as fuck looks like wire fraud and bank fraud to me, but we'll see. At we'll see least. how it plays out in allegedly. court. Allegedly, allegedly, yeah. allegedly, yeah. allegedly. We're not lawyers. I'm telling allegedly. you what it looks like. We're not lawyers. I'm telling you what it looks like to a random guy who's followed the industry for five years. Okay. So anyway. I think uh, it, you can hear our both of our frustrations truly on this. Uh, the SEC did a, a shit job. They did a really bad job. They haven't been go they haven't been doing anything. They've been asleep at the wheel. We've talked about that before as well. Um, it, it's it's all coming back to bite Gary, and good. Sorry. The last thing I was going to add is I'm I'm still not entirely convinced that the cryptocurrency industry is important enough that their general dislike of Gary is going to end up being enough to force him out. And oh, I no, think no. that that will depend on how much gets confirmed about like what the conversations between Sam and FTX and Gary were. And so I am very interested in that. Yeah, me too. But I also think that ha having, having there definitely were American entities and individuals exposed to this situation. 100% sure about that as well. And Having that happen under his watch, having a, a, a multi-billion dollar fraud transpire where you're in conversations with them and you're letting it happen. I mean, he posted a tweet not so long ago suggesting that FTX US has all the money to cover customer deposits. I, you mean, sorry, he, he did. He, he, and then he did it again. Like he very recently tweeted again at, oh, like three hours ago and said, to the best of my knowledge, as of post November 7th, with the potential for heirs, oh Alameda had more assets than liability, mark to market, but not liquid, exclamation point. Alameda had margin position on FTX International and FTX US had enough to repay all customers. And then it ends with not everyone necessarily agrees with this. And I am going to say very bluntly right now, Sam Bankman Freed is lying. Alameda's for the hundredth time for the hundredth time. This is not the first time or the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth. This is it's countless. It is countless. He doesn't speak the truth. He can't. He doesn't know how. I don't think he physically understands how to be honest with people. Don't believe him. For fuck's sake, don't believe him. Which again, now let's go to another topic. The New York Times reported yesterday about that Sam Bankman Freed is getting sleep, I guess is how I'll term it. That's what they reported. Sam Bankman Freed is getting enough sleep. That's good. Um, as as uh, someone pointed out on Twitter, no mention of the word fraud. No mention of the word crime, no mention of any of the the absolute bullshit that has transpired over the past week or two, real, realistically for years, but over the pa exposed to the public over the past week or two, like that it's not being addressed in this article. This big long profile of like the executives at at at, at Alameda and and FTX. I infuriating and and not just for me for every coiner out there for all for people who like DeFi, for people who love bitcoin for people who who are no coiners for skeptics critics everyone was insanely frustrated by this article some people are suggesting it's literally trying to whitewash this guy's crimes which you know i'm not going to suggest that necessarily but it didn't make him look bad it didn't make him look bad at all and i i can't fathom writing this piece and not feeling weird about it. Yeah, so on that, there was another part of it that really bothered me. And it's when they mentioned that Sam was playing video games. And the specific video game which they mention is one that Sam owns, that FTX owns. And there is no mention of that, and the game is mentioned by name. One more mention of this, this like Sam owned product that got into this reporting without even a disclaimer that it was this thing that Sam was connected to. The, the, the entire thing was incredibly frustrating from, from everyone's perspective. And, I, and, and you hate to see it. Um, 
we've talked about some of their reporting before. I think I've I've mentioned uh, I've, I think I've mentioned Kevin Roos by name. Uh, the he did the Latecomers Guide to Crypto. It's just a sorry excuse for an explainer, um, and it's got to be embarrassing now. It has to be embarrassing now. Uh, if it wasn't three or four months ago, um, but. <laughs> I, this is this is the frustration we're feeling. This is this is I think the frustration that skeptics are feeling over the past days and week. As opposed to I know there's people who are frustrated because they lost money. I know there's people who are frustrated because uh, they trusted uh, some of these individuals and they've proven to not be trustworthy. There are people who are frustrated for a lot of different reasons, and I'm. I'm seeing everything we've tried to talk about play out in real time, man. Suzu coming back, tweeting about how he's so frustrated because he tried to go and expose this Ponzi. Hold on, because I, I tweeted directly at him about this, saying what it sounds like to me, because this is his, his explanation, his own explanation for it, is I saw this term sheet, and the term sheet said that they were offering 15% no risk. I mean, it literally sounds like a Ponzi scheme. Some people push back, kind of like, well, but you know, they're trusted, 15% seems fine. And he's like, no, this isn't fine. I, and then he said he sent it to whatever, I don't know, what was it, the block? He sent it to, to a media outlet. And the media outlet at the time didn't, didn't run with the story. And then he was incentivized to trade on FTX via great incentives. Sorry, it sounds to me like you you've had fear of missing out. Like the price of the Ponzi went up. You got really upset because you were trying to call out a Ponzi, especially a competitive Ponzi. And you feared missing out, so you jumped into the pool like a fucking moron, and you jumped into the Ponzi. And then now there's repercussions. I, are you, why are you the hero? It, it's unfathomable to me that these people are coming back and getting heroic, like, red carpet rollouts for them. It's embarrassing. This is embarrassing. Oh, it's worse than that. Do you know why he's play acting the hero? They're trying to raise a new fund. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that is among the reasons that I am filled with rage. Because holy fucking shit, you are not the hero, Kyle, and you are not the hero, Zoo. You did so much with Alameda, you were deeply entwined with them, co-investing, investing in their products, trading with and against them. And when Alameda was not at the top of FTX's leaderboard, most of the time it was you there. I can't, I also can't imagine trying to call out what you suspect is a legitimate fraud and Ponzi scheme and going to one media outlet, saying something to them Having them go like, sorry, we can't run with it. And then being like, okay, I guess I'm done with this. There's how many media outlets in the world? Like how many individuals that can be trusted to try to figure out if this is indeed the, the case? Like you, you could go to anyone. You're, you have, you're a rich dude in crypto. Lots of media outlets would l at least listen to you. And, you. and you're trying to posture like, well, I went to one person and they said no. Get the fuck out of here, dude. Get the fuck out of here. I, yeah, it's infuriating. All of it is super infuriating and people have the memories of worms. I like, I can't, it's, I don't let him come back. What in, what in God's name could possess this industry to be like, oh yeah, he's a victim too. What? There are people actively currently at this minute in my mentions, suggesting that like there's more to come on FTX and it will eventually be revealed that they were the victims of this attack by these unknown people. People join these cults of personality and once they join them and once they follow these individuals, it is very challenging to break some of them of it. Okay, so we've gotten a bit off course we've gotten into a, a lively discussion about some of the entities and people involved but we're, we flew off the course of contagion and contagion risk which is where i want to get us back to right now um we mentioned genesis uh we mentioned uh who who, who else did we mention at the yeah at the very so we, top? we've mentioned blockfi salt genesis 
And I think now we should discuss, so that covers a lot of the lenders. Plus, lenders generally, broadly, should be considered risky. Then we get into, I think, like, exchanges. And there has been some fucking weird behavior from exchanges. And so let's start with Crypto.com, who apparently, in trying to set up a cold storage wallet, sent the entire thing over to another exchange, Gate, and then got most of it back from Gate. And then the CEO also described a bunch of their activity on other exchanges as them hedging and gave very little details about what that entailed and why I, these assets were moving between all these exchanges. Thank God, I, I felt like I was going crazy because no one had called it out yet. And at some point I tweeted about that where I was like, that is not hedging. Like this this guy's explanation of hedging, which I like, I don't even know. I, I'm trying to think about the best way for me to try to explain a hedge, I, like in the simplest, simplest terms, like, um, I guess insurance is a hedge, right? Any kind of insurance is a hedge. Um, so uh, we'll use the example of homeowners insurance, the idea being that, or fire insurance, let's say fire insurance for your home. The, the idea being that the likelihood that there's gonna be a fire is close to zero. Like the chance that your home burns down is almost zero. But as long as you think there might be some little percentage of a chance, it's worth your time to have some sort of a hedge where if the house does indeed burn down, you get some of that capital back so that you can try to rebuild your home. That's the idea of any hedge, right? The idea of any hedge is you have a bet that you're pretty sure is gonna be a winner, but you're hedging it with something that in case this is a total loss. What this guy described was taking US dollar derivatives and buying volatile assets on another exchange and then moving those coins back to his exchange. Explain the hedge to me. I'm waiting to hear how that's a hedge. So, Cass, do you remember how Coinbase had Bitcoins on Bitfinex in the 2016 hack? It, there have been cryptocurrency exchanges which will sometimes try to take advantage of the liquidity of other exchanges by running their own prop trading desks and market making firms internally. And I think that in some of the worst cases, this has involved these firms lending customer assets to these non-independent or not truly independent market making and prop trading firms associated with this. And I, and I think that the Alameda research and FTX one that we have most recently seen is not that atypical, except perhaps at the scale. But this is something that we've seen before. Like I, 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 I again, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm taking crazy pills because we see Bitmex and Arthur have a prop prop desk trading against their own customers years ago, years ago, and they're caught red-handed, and everybody knows it's a thing, and Arthur Hayes gets in trouble, and I'm just curious why anyone would expect that behavior to change. I don't, I, I don't know. Juan Carlo Davisini and Silvano Di Stefano, the chief financial officer and chief investment officer of Tether, are currently partners in a cryptocurrency hedge fund. JL Vanderveld, the CEO of both Bitfinex and Tether, is the executive director of a VC fund. You mentioned Arthur Hayes at BitMEX. Coinbase is being investigated for insider trading. We had Alameda Research and FTX. We have Crypto.com, which has historically run their own market maker for years. Like. Uh, even Gemini is currently being sued by the CFTC for their manipulative trading practices when they were running the uh, futures auction. And so, like, it has been common for these exchange owners to take on these very compromised positions. Yeah, we, I, this is, so again, here, bringing it back to Contagion. So we are, are talking about exchanges now, which I think we're we mentioned crypto.com. I think the cons there's concerns. We yeah. don't have any. No, yeah, there's, there's no, no hard there's no evidence solvent or anything. Exactly. There's no hard evidence of anything. There the is CEOs acting doing, weird. There's proof of them doing inexplicable on chain things, things that suggest incompetence, like sending your cold wallet to another exchange. The best case scenario for that is incompetence. 
which is it questions whether you should be trusting them with your funds. Yeah, um, no, but I think the reason no, no, so just to be clear, I think the reason I keep bringing up these conflicts of interest and stuff is because that's part of what causes the contagion is because when you have these people who are conflicted, who have these different groups of interest pulling against them, it becomes more easy to get pulled and to take this action that is unethical, that is wrong because you exist in this compromised position. And so because of that, we end up seeing a lot of the behavior we've seen in cryptocurrency of lending to related parties, like the story of Bitfinex and Tether, like the story of FTX and Alameda, like all of these different examples. And so it's because we have allowed so many of these conflicts to persist. Yes. And, and this again, bring it back is, uh, we've got, we've got essentially mention of crypto.com gate, uh, dot IO, uh, who was involved in this weird transaction. Um, I, there's some other, there's some other names being dropped around for exchanges. I don't think, um, I don't think they're generally hugely traded. I think Huobi is one um, name getting floated around. Again, names getting floated around doesn't mean anything. It just means that people are discussing it and wondering exactly what's going on. And we can't, there's no suggestion we know, we know. Um, so a lot of exchanges though. I think the concern is a lot of exchanges might be doing weird stuff. Um, but it doesn't end there unfortunately, because the contagion that I also want to talk about is that there could be contagion risk within banks, within actual banks. Um, and we know, we don't know what the exposure is. We don't know if it's just deposits or what exactly it is, but we know that, for instance, Dell Tech had exposure to FTX Alameda. Uh, we know that because they said it was not a large exposure, essentially. They said it wasn't a big deal. We had exposure. Um, so we don't know what that means, but Dell Tech had some sort of exposure to this. Um, I think there's word being passed around that did Silvergate or did they not? Silvergate didn't? Silvergate had deposits. I don't think they had exposure to Alameda via loans because Silvergate only offers at this point the Bitcoin backed loans. And I don't think Alameda ever had enough Bitcoin for that to be like a real source of exposure for them. And if they did, Silvergate would just liquidate those positions, right? And so uh, I think it's just that a, a meaningful portion of their deposits may have been Alameda Research and those may now be tied up and there will be presumably less demand going forward for crypto deposits because I expect this uh, bear market to continue as we see the full extent of this contagion. Uh, speaking of Dell Tech, Dell Tech's an interesting case because they have they, besides running Dell Tech Bank and Trust, also have Dell Chain, which is their cryptocurrency based offshoot, which is a combination of a whole bunch of different things, including like Fulgur Alpha, the cryptocurrency hedge fund that they onboarded to Bitfinex back when Paulo Arduino was an executive director of Dell Chain. Um, and then they've got some various other funds and offshoot that invest in various crypto things and have exposure to various crypto things. And we knew that Alameda Research was banking at Dell Tech, presumably in part because it made transacting with Tether easier. Because, as we've previously discussed, like in our episode about the Tether papers, Alameda was the single largest issuer of Tethers. Um, they also, Dell Chain, may have been trading against or doing other things with Alameda Research. So we have to figure out, like, what's the exposure just in terms of what deposits to Alameda there, but also what other business could Alameda Research and Dell Chain be doing together? Yep, it's a good question. And uh, we also this again, now here we go final contagion risk, I think here. So as we've, we've discussed, um, initially, lenders, we see that lending contagion and risk getting transferred onto um, equity firms and private capital. Once those are getting hit, then we're seeing flight, capital flight and liquidity crunches at exchanges, which seems to be causing problems. And if we can, if we can zoom out a bit. There's a couple more things here, which is one, banks, like we just mentioned. Um, there's also stocks um, that are exposed to the industry. So we can, you know, mention MicroStrategy, uh, obviously Coinbase trades um, on the, I believe, NASDAQ. We've got, uh, we've got a bunch of blockchain, uh, like Bitcoin mining companies that are public. Uh, in one way or another, they seem to all be going belly, belly up. Um, and finally, the last one I'm going to mention, which I think is something a lot of 
our listeners and viewers have been pushing us on is stable coin risk. What is going to happen? And look, I just want to start this off. We have no idea what's going to happen. Um, last, last episode, you and I were in agreement. I truly hope that everything is safe and sound in all of these stable coins and that they have been conservative and um, cautious when it comes to using these funds and staying solvent. But I have my doubts. Um, and I, 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 you know, at some point when we get this up, I'd love to point people to um, Patio, uh, Patrick McKenzie's thread about their solvency and essentially saying like, even if we go and take them at their word, their transparency reports, they're insolvent. <laughs> um, and I think there might be some truth there. Um, he generally knows what he's talking about when he's doing uh, back of napkin math. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, let's uh, I, I, let's get your thoughts on the the stable coin contagion risk. So let's start with the basics. If any of the major stable coins break, let's say Paxos Circle or Tether, there are immediate and severe consequences across exchanges, across DeFi, and across a whole bunch of places as they collapse. Now. We're talking about Tether because we know, as was reported in the Tether papers, that Alameda was the largest issuer of Tether. Tether's balance sheet has always been razor thin, assets over liabilities, and as their balance sheet has gotten less liquid from the like original full cash backing into now having these treasuries and these ETFs and all these other commercial paper, well, they're gone with commercial paper now, right? It's all gone. I think it's all gone. Let's say it's all gone. Whatever fiduciary deposits and CD accounts and whatever other things they say they have. Um, secured and in, in un secured loans. unsecured loans. And uh, and then we definitely have cryptocurrency tokens, yes. equity in other aspects. VC other... investments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so because of that, because of the relative illiquidity of some of the assets backing Tether, compared to the small amount of assets over liabilities they have, they are not structurally well set up for mass redemptions. This has been true for quite some time and has arguably gotten better as they've shifted more to treasuries away from the more relatively illiquid commercial paper. But the other problem here is that we are taking Tether at their word. Tether with a history of manipulating their attestations. Tether who since Stuart Hogner went on CNBC and promised an audit was months, not years away, has changed auditors two times. That's by the way, by the way, trust. no audit, no audit. He said that over a year ago. He said it was months away, months, weeks or months away. And uh, it's been another year, no audit. I don't think we're ever going to see a real audit from them. They keep trying to posture that BDO, uh, you know, it, what do they say? It's the fourth or fifth largest um, auditor in the world. No, they use BDO Italia. They, it, it's different. It's different. It's like using KPMG China and saying, we're using one of the top auditors in the world. No, you're not. No, you're not. Um, so I take that with a big fat grain of salt as well. Um, and their their assurances, their assurances, they're not audits. We don't know how the money got there. We have we don't know how much proof is being shown and what that proof actually is. Like there's a lot of question and we've seen things before where Tether moves funds, moves funds from Bitfinex and puts them into a bank account so that it looks like they are solvent when there's a snapshot and then move the funds right back to Bitfinex. So we've seen this stuff before. They have lied. They've lied to their customers just like just like FTX, just like SBF, trying to herald them as, as heroes right now, I think is a huge mistake I've been seeing made by a lot of dudes, a lot of traders, a lot of people in the cryptocurrency space suggesting like, well, see, this is proof that Tether's great. Hmm weird lesson to take away from all of this well and i think the other thing is um like alameda and is is just to kind of emphasize some of the strangeness here is alameda was issued by november of 2021 about 31 billion tethers i think the total by now has reached over 35 billion um and they were like one of the people who was heavily arbitraging the tether peg during the ust related depegging of tether 
a while back. And so Alameda Research was a very important counterparty for Tether. And they got issued this absurd amount of Tethers and did not redeem near that amount of Tethers, at least when we, at least when the analysis was conducted. And when we went through all the Alameda Research wallets and stuff, there was like 100 million Tethers, I think, 150 million maybe. And like when Tether was ordered by law enforcement, supposedly, to freeze all the Tethers in FTX's account, luckily a few hours before they were hacked, there was only what like 45 million tethers that were at all of FTX and so there's there's this kind of weirdness where I have struggled immensely to figure out some of like the flows from tether to Alameda and where those tethers were dispersed out to and where they've gone and so if I had a better understanding of like where that demand was coming from and where they were being sold to I might be more confident in like starting to think tether might be okay but like there's this kind of weird inexplicable flow and this inexplicable demand like where those where was the demand sink that those tethers were going to where did they flow to and why have they stayed there why like and this is another thing like the overall cryptocurrency market cap has fallen to something like 500 billion dollars and like a hundred billion dollars of that or more is comprised of stable coins they are just this increasingly massive portion of the total like market cap of cryptocurrency and yet redemptions have happened but they've been relatively slow well and there's no way we can prove a redemption right um, yeah no i we can see the supply go down but that doesn't really mean anything like no, we, you're, we you're have... right we don't know what that transaction actually is we don't know what they get back or what was given for that tether in the first place that's and that's the point i want to drive home right there that that's exactly the question that's the question we don't have an answer to which is what how did they get these tethers because there's reason to believe and this is through history i'm not i'm not just making this up there's reason to believe that they loan out these tethers for you know they're just they're loaning them out they're not this is not they're not getting dollars in return when they loan out these tethers um and we we know that they've done this before just based on their discussions with crypto capital core uh crypto capital corp um where they they essentially acknowledged lending crypto capital um tether or we also know that they have secured lending agreements with several other places they had agreements with babel finance with celsius with nexo and with platforms like that where they take on bitcoins and then issue them alone denominated in tethers right but um yeah this is kind of the fundamental issue is if tether operates as they say they do they are they or the way they were supposed to historically, the way they promised to operate, was to only take in dollars and then give out the tethers and keep the dollars, right? And the fundamental issue is, if Tether has taken in all those dollars and bought these yield-generating assets, like, why is it so illiquid? Why is there so few assets over liability? And why is it, like, structured the way it is? Why does it seem like there's like the there hasn't been that same amount of dollars that have gone in? And is it just that Tether is taking all the yield off the top and they're keeping it as illiquid as possible so they can make as much as possible? Maybe. But it's like this other kind of just challenging part of understanding the full, like, truth of the financial picture of these interrelated entities. I mean, thank God interest rates are high right now because they are at least they're seemingly profitable. At least they could seemingly be sitting on these reserves of assets. Um, I don't know why we call I just thought about this the other day too. I don't know why we call them reserves. They're not reserves, they're customer deposits. Like this is not, reserves aren't cu customer deposits. That's a separate thing. Reserves are like a, a rainy day fund. Like we're, we, we keep s s talking about reserves when it comes, whether it's like cryptocurrency exchanges or stable coins or these different entities within within the um, industry and I, we shouldn't be using the term reserves these aren't reserves they should all be there it's not it's not a reserve it's customer deposits you can't touch them you can't touch them unless you are explicitly told that you can um so i i don't know it's the, all of this is so frustrating for me and eye-opening eye-opening for how naked everyone was swimming during all of this uh it's it's not surprising. It's just d disappointing, I think. FTX and Sam Bankman Fried were just given so much unjustified laudatory coverage.
The conflict of interest with Alameda Research was incredibly obvious the entire time. The extent of the behavior may not have been, but that was. That was clear from the very first day FTX started. And that was a thing that every single person who promoted it, who invested in it, whatever, had to look past in order to convince themselves it was a good thing to do. And some of them found themselves overlooking a lot of things in their rush to convince themselves it was a good idea, like the idiots at Sequoia. Yeah, I, I, it's, um, it's pretty interesting to me that like we're two guys who are amateur sleuths essentially. I mean, not maybe not anymore. I guess now we professionally uh, <laughs> get to sleuth around on chain and and check things out. But but up until the past year, uh, we were doing this for free and not getting paid by. A, a media company and we still crypto critics corner is free right this 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 whole thing is totally free and we're doing it with our own time donating our own time our own energy to try to do some due diligence on this stuff and i i find it truly astounding that it seems like these firms don't have any on-chain analysis going on it seems like they don't have anyone looking through these pitch decks and going uh, this is really weird and we need to dig into it. It's that it's the, when we had, um, Elizabeth Lopato on to talk about Elizabeth Holmes, um, and Theranos, you had the same thing happening where instead you have teams that you're supposed to be utilizing to do the due diligence. But if you feel the FOMO, if you feel that fear of missing out, well, everyone else is jumping in. I, th those people know how to do due, due diligence. Like if they know how to do it, then I don't need to even worry about putting my due diligence team on this. I'm going to jump in. And it's, it's the worst kind of behavior. It's like your, you, you, your whole thing is you have to make more capital, but if you're not doing any due diligence, you've just risked all your capital. You've just done no risk assessment and you have no idea what your risk profile is. It's shocking to me. It has become very common for cryptocurrency companies who are raising venture capital rounds to try to open and then close the round in the same day. And so if you want to be invest, if you want to like be in this, you gotta like get in or it's like pulled from venture capitalists. And so they are incentivized to do very little due diligence because if they delay to look into something, just like Elizabeth Holmes threatened to do to investors, they may lose their place in the round. And in many of these cases where growth is seen, sorry, where growth seems so extraordinary because of these bubbles that seem to keep reoccurring, when these valuations are blowing up like this, you see like this absolute rush where due diligence is counter incentivized because to do it would mean you would lose money or at least feel like you're losing money. And this is the other trick that crypto VCs pull and why they love tokens is because they can actually get to liquidity soon enough that they don't lose money, that they get like a 90% discount and they dump it as soon as it goes on sale. Or if you're Alameda Research, you lie to the New York Times and tell them you have $11 billion in venture losses. Uh, also, the idea, I think there was a, almost a mythology around this that like, oh, you can get out. You can get your equity out so fast. You, you just tokenize it. A lot of them it. stopped taking it out because it's, it was... And th th this is the serum thing with, with FTX and Alameda where they have, I think, uh, maybe I'm getting this wrong, but I think they have $2.2 billion worth of serum um, if, if serum were able to maintain its current price. But of course, if you try to sell any of that, you dump the market. But then, I, and tell me if I'm wrong about this too, the Serum, the Serum team then forked Serum so that now Alameda doesn't have, doesn't have access to that anymore, which also seems wildly insane to me. Serum is among the assets that Alameda Research was valuing at more than their market cap.
This is why when Sam made his post saying that they had that Alameda had more assets than liabilities, I called him a fucking liar because he was fucking lying. That is not a reasonable way to mark those assets. That is an absolutely unreasonable way to mark the value of serum when you control that much of the fully diluted value. It is a fucking bullshit technique to blow up your numbers, and that's exactly what they tried to do with it. And I am not sure about the details of the serum fork, but yeah, I imagine that there's a decent chance they're going to want to fork away from Alameda because Alameda has just an absurd portion of the total supply. How did they and get there? How did they because, get there, though? Because Sam and Gary, the co-founders of FTX, co-founded Serum. I, I mean, I know how they got there, but I'm just saying this is there's no I feel like there's no meaningful um, reflection. <laughs> like I, we're here we are now we're heralding Suzu and we're bringing back Kyle Davies. And you know what? Fuck it. Let's 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 find out what Do Kwan wants to say about this situation, because he knows about total collapses and fraud. So let's get him on to talk about it and see what he thinks. What are we doing? What are we doing? Stop floundering, floundering, flailing, flailing, embarrassing. So, so embarrassing. I just don't get it. And I like it's it, people keep talking about like getting the grown up in the room. What fucking grown up? What fucking grown up? Show me a fucking grown up. I like they're not here. We're not even grown up compared to the shit that, that, like, there should be professionals. Sam is still tweeting. Sam is still tweeting. This dude, I, I, I'm His not His parents one... are fucking lawyers. Exactly. How the I'm not... fuck does he not know to shut up? <laughs> I don't need to be the one to tell him to shut his fucking mouth. He's not going to listen to me. He's not going to, apparently he's not going to listen to his parents. He's not going to listen to John Ray, one of the great bankruptcy and fraud lawyers in history. Who's he... Who's he going to listen to? And I, I think the answer is only himself. Only himself. He's not, he does not, everyone thinks like, oh, boy genius has all these lawyers. He's going to get out of this. He's smart enough to know that he can get out of it. And that's why he's behaving this way. No, no. Boy genius is a sociopath and won't listen to anybody. Boy genius is going to go to jail. Boy genius is in big fucking trouble. And maybe he doesn't fully comprehend it yet. Maybe I don't know. But like that, what did they say? The the, the 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 New York Times article where he was like, I don't even know what I'm. I haven't even I haven't even thought about what I'm doing. It's going to be multiple words. Don't tweet, dumbass. I like stop tweeting. Stop. And then he talks to the New York Times. I just I can't. I can't fathom. I can't fathom. His parents are shitting themselves and so pissed right now they have to be they have to be if you're a lawyer you're watching this and especially if you're going to be his working dad for the helped with ftx his dad this was like <laughs> I, they and they worked in the they worked in the charity arm you know his mom i like whatever dude whatever they they, they have to be pissed every attorney unless you know you're going to be bringing in you know lawsuits against them those people are licking their lips right now those attorneys are licking their keep tweeting Keep tweeting, brother. Those guys are stoked about it. I think any lawyer that would want to defend SPF has to be just beating their head and pulling their hair out, just begging him to stop. Begging. But he's not going to. So we, we can all shout about him begging him to stop. Employees were, there was a, I think, Autism Capital on, on Twitter posted like an employee a chat from the slack where employees specifically were like why are you why are you trolling on twitter like isn't that what got us into this mess and he's like hmm maybe i'm doing it wrong i'll consider that i just thought it would stop the troll like the, the mob army that's coming after me you think trolling on twitter will calm people down like no dude i'm sorry this guy is not a gene like he's genius in he in very very specific ways he went to he went to stanford so he, he's clearly got some IQ, but who cares? Uh, like he has no, he, he's not a genius as far as I'm concerned in every, in, in every important aspect of his life. Didn't he go to MIT? Whatever. His parents are Stanford educated lawyers or yes, worked for yes. Stanford. He went to MIT. He's boy genius, boy wonder. No, he isn't. No, he isn't. It's, this is nonsense. He's a it, narcissist and a sociopath. It's, 
It's absurd that he's still tweeting. It is absurd that he thinks the way Alameda was valuing Serum and Maps and FIDA and Oxy and FTX token was at all acceptable. And it's absurd that he thinks that he can explain away stealing 10 or $11 billion in customer deposits by like saying, I, my impression was there's more assets than liabilities. And, and also, also, also fucking Sam, if FTX US had enough to pay back every customer, why are withdrawals not open? Why is it declaring bankruptcy? Because the money's there. The money's there and it's ready to be given back. That's why. Um, uh, what's next? Bennett, what's next? What are we, what are we, what are we waiting for? What shoes are going to drop? Do we think there's any more shoes to drop or are we, we near the end of this contagion now? It, I remember it, us talking about contagion a while ago and I said, are we just getting it or, or is it finally moving out of our system? Uh, we know the answer to it back then, which was we were just getting it. But now, now, how do you feel? It, it is not over. I, my details are a little fuzzy on this, but I think after Lehman Brothers collapsed, it took like another like two or three months for the full extent of the contagion to be felt as it gradually like moved through the financial system. And I think that there are counterparties with exposure to Alameda and FTX who have not been fully upfront about their exposure yet. I think we are going to continue to hear about entities with exposure. And I think that that is going to have ramifications across the industry. Besides speaking more directly, this has brought the attention of whatever regulatory apparatus remains in Washington, D.C., and the law enforcement apparatus as well, are now going to be even more interested in cryptocurrency. We mentioned after the collapse of Luna and Terra that they were starting to become more interested, and since then we have seen more enforcement action, and now you just gave them a really good excuse. You had your name on umpires. You had your name on stadiums. You've been all over the airwaves. Everyone, you wanted everyone to know your name. Now they do. Yeah. Uh, it's just, um, yeah, it's unrelenting. Um, it's really unrelenting. And, and uh, every time I think it can't possibly get weirder or worse, it gets weirder and it gets worse. Um, I presume Bennett's on the same page with me where it's just, uh, it's almost hard it's 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 almost hard to fully take in everything as it's transpiring because everything is happening so fast like not not the actual collapse and contagion which is like slowly playing out but we're getting constant like okay fucking sbf is still tweeting so everyone's talking about that oh we have all these other exchange executives tweeting all the time so we have questions about that we have the banks being extra quiet and not super confirming anything. So we have questions about that. Stablecoin guys are like, we're seeing withdrawals, but everything's fine. So we have questions about that. There's there's a million questions going around, but all that we're getting in return are just like half answers. Not dodgy, dodgy answers to the question that don't actually answer any of the questions. And I that, think that... you mean unrivaled transparency. <laughs> I've been told that this is what passes for unrivaled transparency. Is this not unrivaled transparency? I, blockchains awesome. make everything transparent, right? That's why we didn't realize FTX. That's why we didn't realize FTX didn't have a cold wallet until like three days before this they is, declared yeah, bankruptcy. Exactly. It's it's such a good it's such a good point too. Where it's like everyone says like, well, the blockchain brings all this transparency to it, and there's truth to that. There's truth to like, I you know. Those transactions can be publicly viewed. You can use um, Etherscan or um, any number of different, you know, blockchain or whatever, like you, breadcrumbs. You can use any, any kind of tool that you want to try to, like, track these things. But there's still ways to obfuscate. And lo and behold, when it comes to liabilities and actual cash in your bank accounts, if you're a company, uh, if you can't prove those things, Everything else kind of becomes meaningless. Um, and and I, like, if, if that isn't what FTX tells you and Alameda tells you, I don't know what lesson you're taking away here. If you think proof of funds or something or like any level of 
it, if everyone was paying attention to it and didn't believe a word they were saying, you couldn't prove that it was necessarily a fraud immediately on chain. I, I know that that's true. I know it. I just, the proof of reserves, it, it needs, this is why the large transfers between exchanges like crypto.com sending it to gate trouble me somewhat because it's the same kind of pattern we saw with Bitfinex helping Tether manipulate their attestations, which were assets that were there for a brief, very brief snapshot in time and then were sent back immediately after that, that were being used specifically to manipulate attestations. I very much hope that none of the exchanges currently promoting their proof of reserves are participating in anything like that. Yep. Um, anything else, Bennett? Are there any other updates that we haven't touched on? I'm sure there is, right? Like, I, I'm sure there's been more while we've been chatting. <laughs> this has been absurd. Um, yeah, it's, it's wild. Um, I just want to remind everyone, like, if you're actually, like, in a mentally troubly, troubled place right now, if you're really genuinely not feeling good about this, I mean, I'm, I'm personally exhausted and a little beaten down, but if you're in a worse place than that and you're feeling, um, desperate, I guess is the right way to put it, call profession call seek professional help please please seek professional help uh or at least reach out to some friends and try to talk your way through this uh never ever ever do anything silly that you can't take back is the way i'm going to put it um there are a lot of people out there who care about you and want what's best for you um money is not everything in this world i know it often can feel that way especially when we talk about it and cryptocurrency revolves around it and it can suddenly feel really bad if you don't have it. Um, so I don't know, just stay sane, stay, uh, and, and just try to stay present and okay. And, uh, I don't know. I hope everybody's okay. I hope everybody's okay. And we'll see what happens. We're going to keep you guys updated. Yeah. Stay, stay safe out there and there's more important things.